Hey, what's going on, everybody? Video 44 coming at you another video. All right, so I'm just sitting here listening to some of my old stuff from earlier today. Not really old, but you know, something that I may have done about 12 hours ago to be exact. And I was all in the camera eating my food and just really, really telling the Lakers that they needed to, you know, get their act together as I always do and uh, value um, just just overall everything that we have going on in the moment but also value the future and balance. You know, that's really what my, my, my mission is right now. It's just try to find talent where you can in, in the lowest, you know, levels possible. You know, reach for the lowest um, value players that you can raise value uh, from. You know, players that can help you get better um, by getting better themselves. You know what I mean? Just, just overall progression. And so... Not to say that I want to get players that haven't necessarily, you know, shown that they can do anything. But I think if you start looking in the pools of, 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 of players that haven't gotten opportunities, you know, if you studied certain player situations, you'll see that, that it's not that they couldn't play. It's just that a coach didn't necessarily believe in them or had a very short uh, rope for playing them because a superstar played their position and they may have had two backups ahead of them or something like that. And so guys get lost into situations where they don't play and then when they do get on the floor if they make a mistake which the situation's already pressured uh then they have to sit you know what I mean or if the matchup is is kind of funny and they get cooked by a superstar who they happen to just have to happen to be forced to guard because another guy got hurt or something like that and they don't do well and you don't see them for three games they come back they get uh, injured you know what I mean that kind of thing you just got to study guy situations because sometimes it can be as simple as a dude just never getting a chance and if you find him on the back of a bench you you may you know see that he can play you may see that you can kind of turn him into something better than what he is or what have you and, and and then you have an asset out of nowhere so when you're in the Lakers situation and the Clippers situation the Nets situation or even some of the other situations like the Minnesota um, Atlanta teams who have uh, given away a lot of picks Miami certain teams that have uh, bad contracts, stuff like that. This is what I think they need to do. They need to be looking for players in these situations um, that may not necessarily fit where they are, but may definitely fit you. And so as I listened to As It Stands today, um, he had a, a, a quick video where he was talking about the possibility of the Lakers going after some Philadelphia guys. And I kind of like what he was saying there. It's kind of along the lines of what I'm thinking. Um, two dudes uh, by the name of Matisse Thibel and Forkin Korgmas. I don't know if I've ever said his name correctly, but I think that's, that is how I've heard it said. Uh, he's a shooter. And, of course, if we know of Matisse, he's a, three, uh, a defensive player. Doesn't really score at all. But I've seen him put the ball in the hoop several times uh, in various games that I've seen him play in. So the potential for him to help on that end uh, – is there so if anything you know he's going to be a genius defensive player a big young Patrick Beverly at a different position you know what I mean that's the kind of thing he's not going to help you too much offensively but defensively he's elite and I don't think he's ever had a chance to really display that you know I always had uh, ideas about what he and Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid could be like if they were given big minutes together you know never mind the fact that both of those guys Ben and he didn't really score much but the fact of the matter is neither would the other team because them dudes would lock you down and I just don't think they really explored that as much as I would have wanted to based on the fact that we're in a spacing era and they couldn't really shoot but a guy like Matisse Thibault coming to this situation we're all about three-point discipline if you ask me I know people are saying we need to get three-point shooters on this team and I definitely think that is a remedy for a problem that we have but we also have an identity as I've mentioned before and if we happen to add players that don't shoot to this team it won't hurt the identity because we don't shoot at all we have spacers that can help us shoot but we average probably about 33 three-point shots a game somewhere around there which is low for the average on this in this league and we still score enough to keep up with most teams what we need is defense what we need is players who can help us with size and I look at Matisse and I say he can be one of the better players in these small ball lineups that we love to run. You know, if I got to put somebody at a small ball five that is really, really talented at the three point, you know, at the defensive side of the ball, I'm looking for a guy like Matisse Thibault who's going to be so crafty and intelligent um, and, and strong that he should be able to, to be able to hold his own in certain situations. 
Now, granted, I don't ever want to put anybody in undersized situations. So don't get it wrong. This is not something I would want to do. But if Darvin would want to do that, he's the type of player where I say, okay, that's somebody I would put on the team. So I don't know if the Lakers are looking in that direction. I know shooting is a big, big deal. Obviously, we don't have enough shooting. And I think, like I said, anybody who's looking to bring shooting in onto this team is, is looking in the right direction. No question about it. Uh, but I don't think adding a player like Matisse at a low price, given the fact that the Philadelphia 76ers, from what he said, um, is it, it may be looking to uh, get rid of Matisse and, and, and Forcon as, as salary dumps and maybe willing to add a second-round pick to getting rid of them. If that's the case, I don't see a reason the Lakers shouldn't be looking to see what they can do in that situation. Um, and Forcon is a shooter, you know. Korkmaz is a shooter, and he's hit threes, multiple threes in many games, so we should be targeting him anyway, uh, given the fact that he doesn't have a role on his own team. So it's a guy who never left the Philadelphia 76ers. He's always been there, and if I'm not mistaken, he was initially a lottery pick. If I'm not mistaken, a lottery pick that they held over for like two years, I think that's the same person. I might be wrong, but nevertheless, he's a three-point shooter. Uh, I think I am wrong about that, actually. I might be getting mixed up with Dario Saric or something, but... um. Nevertheless, this is somebody who can definitely shoot the ball. And I, I don't see any uh, downside to targeting him independent of Matisse Thibel. Uh It's just it's a no-brainer. You want to get somebody like that, especially since we're targeting um, guys like Bogey at, at much higher prices. I think if you go for a Forkan, Korkamas, you might be able to get some of those same shots up. Um, you know what I mean? At a much lower price. So I, that's that's what we need to be looking, stuff like that, man. Um so, yeah, I just wanted to second that, to be honest with you. I thought that was a really solid consideration. I don't know what the, the price tag would be there. I hadn't heard anything other than what he said. Um, but if they would be willing to throw in a second-round pick, I think that's that's a home run for the Lakers. <laughs> Anybody willing to give us pick equity in any trade of any kind is, is crazy, is, as far as I can tell. Um, I've heard a lot of people saying they're excited about possibly adding Alec Burke along with Bogey. I just don't. I don't know, man. I know Alec Burks can play. I know he can play. I've seen him put up some nice scoring numbers, especially in New York. He had a really nice stint there. Uh, but I'm, I look at him like a Wayne Ellington. You know what I mean? He's, we're going to add him, and he's going to give us like Wayne Ellington type stuff. I, I just don't see that as somebody. Uh, he is somebody that's going to really raise his value when he gets here. Uh, and, and I don't think he's going to move the needle for us very much. He will help with shooting, though. But I think we'll probably end up giving up the on the other end defensively we'd begin giving up a lot so i think the lakers um should probably look to go younger in that regard man more upside i think don't don't try to acquire tweener type of contracts that aren't really good to players that are role players that's a really bad way to go for when you want to when you're in our situation uh because a lot of times role players are at a good price right for what it is that they are uh, it may not necessarily be a good price, you know what I mean, for who they actually are and where they're at in their careers. If he's at like ten million a year, uh, uh-uh, you don't want that. You, I don't know what his contract is, but that's just on average what I'm looking at and thinking about. Usually, guys like that get like three-year, ten million-dollar contracts. I wouldn't want to pay that price for Alec Burks. So I'm just thinking about that kind of thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to bring in Bogdanovich. I, I, listen. I've said enough about that. You know, I think he's an excellent shooter, a consistent player. I just don't know that he's going to give us one or two first-round picks worth of play. But if you can get him without giving up those picks, obviously that's something we want to do. Um, and that's the thing. Is there a way we can get some of these targeted players without giving up those two picks? Maybe we have to throw in some players. Now, this is something I haven't really talked about. But if the Lakers are going to be looking to get any trades done, they're probably going to have to give up some players that we don't want to give up. Maybe some guys that we're hoping to resign that probably don't have we don't have plans of actually resigning because our front office tends to do things a little funny. Now, I've been thinking about Thomas Bryant, man, and the reality is he is an offensive center who could really help us uh, when AD gets back as so long as AD is willing to hold down the defense by himself. He'll definitely help with rebounding, and he'll definitely assist with scoring, but he's not going to help you defensively. And at the price tag he's at with one point something million dollars and the way he's been playing these last two weeks, he has trade value. He has a lot of it. Now, I don't know to what extent to where you get so much back for him or what have you, but the demand for the player should be there. Um, I look at Dennis Schroeder and I say, I don't know if he has much value because he's had so many ups and downs, but he's had some big moments with it. I'm sure 
with us, I'm sure it wouldn't be too difficult to get rid of him if we attach him to other stuff. Um, you know, Kendrick Nunn, same thing. Patrick Beverly, we know what his contract situation is. Russell Westbrook, obviously, we know that contract. People want picks for that, so I don't, I don't want to move that if that's what the case would be. But, like, when I start thinking about some of these players, like Lonnie Walker, free agent, I don't want to let him go. But if the Lakers aren't going to re-sign him, he needs to be traded. You know, Austin Reeves, we love Austin here. We want to re-sign him. But if they're not going to re-sign him, we don't want him to walk for nothing. So these are things I'm, I'm looking at. I'm saying Rob Palenka, Jeannie Buss, you know, you got you to gotta consider what your, what your uh, negotiation process will be with those guys. And, and, and we got to hit a home run here. We can't let more talent walk out the doors. We talk about all the time. So that, that's what comes to mind when we talk about the Lakers. You know, I understand that we have some fantastic scouts, as we talk about all the time. So if we lose talent, I don't doubt we can find more. But at the same time, when we find guys we like, especially ones that we can rely upon for, for key stuff, um, you got to try to retain them, man. And if you don't retain them, you recognize you have them, you like what they are, and you got to trade them for something. So uh, somebody will like them too. That's basically what I'm saying. So this, these are the times with Rob Palenka. You know, I saw the little exchange that he had with Rich Paul at the game yesterday. Uh, it seemed to me that they had, had, you know, obviously they weren't talking about anything serious around everyone else. Uh, but the body language didn't look too confident. You know, it, it looked like he was telling Rich Paul, I can't make her do something she don't want to do. That's what I read into it. <laughs> That's what the body language looked like to be the F44. Uh, so who knows, right? Who knows what, what, what the conversation was. But the point here is they made it a point to make sure they were seen talking to each other in public with a certain level of doubt in that. And I know that's a display. Those guys are smart. They know exactly what they're being seen doing and where and what time. So this is one of them situations where I'm like, look, Jeannie, you know, they're, they're waiting for you to ease up off of something, obviously. That's that's just what the, the elephant in the room is. They know that the only way they're going to move is if you let go of those picks. You said you're open-minded to not trading those picks, which signals to me that you don't want to trade them at all. I'm kind of along the same lines as we talk about all the time, but this is what's going on. This is what the Lakers fans are looking at. They want to get better. So uh, that's that's just that's just the, the, the overall consensus. Everybody's waiting for a trade. And, uh, you know, I, th I think I think Rich Paul believes he has something big that he can give the Lakers. I think um, I think they believe something big can happen. That's what I think. Do I believe big equals good? Not in my mind, not necessarily. Not if it's bringing back a Bradley Beal or Zach Levine. But I think that's what they're trying to do. Man. They're trying to find a way to get LeBron another superstar player to add to the situation. Maybe a replacement for Russell Westbrook, a more permanent replacement, maybe. Um, maybe two two guys, maybe. That's what I honestly think. Maybe two guys um, that can kind of split that salary in half, possibly. But that's, that's what I think the Lakers are doing. They're trying to get two names. They want names. And my thing is, if them names can't come with the intangibles that help us win we're just gonna lose with those names and we're gonna be attached to those contracts you know and so for me it's like if you're gonna do that you know you're still rolling the dice that's what it comes down to you not necessarily have a found you don't have a foundation under that you're just going ahead and, and, and trying something and hoping it works again just like the Russell Westbrook thing and so my my question is this is what I don't necessarily understand once all this plays itself out, we get through this year, we make the trade, we get the first round picks out of here. Next year, are we still expecting these same players to be here? If not, do we have a contingency plan on getting that equal type of talent without those tradable picks? Um, you know what I mean? How does that work in a Lakers mind? Or are we going to be walking into next season just marginally better than this season and hoping we can get to the playoffs again? And if that's the case... Are we sure that's a necessary path when we have assets we can trade to reset our situation? Um, because if you're just going to have a couple of losing seasons anyway, you might as well lose with a purpose. And so that's my question is, what does it look like to, to the Rob Palenka and Jeannie Buss when they do whatever it is they're about to do for this season? Start the process of the summertime and then going into next season having already traded those picks away. Like, what is the vision there? You just get the trophy. Is that? It? Do you just assume you're about to win the championship this year, after you make that move and then figure it out? Is that what you guys are thinking? I think that's a, one of the worst bets in the history of sports, to be honest with you. 
Um, <laughs> to, be, to be completely honest with you, that's a horrible, horrible way to go. Um, you gotta have a plan. That's essentially what I'm saying. Once you trade those picks away and you bring in whatever the Zach Levine piece is, are you ready for Bron to walk? Because that's a very good chance he's, he could leave for nothing. You know, are, are you ready for AD to go down again? You know, how, how bad are you expecting his next injury to be? You know, do you just assume he's going to play the 82 games for the next six years? Is that where your head's at, Laker Nation? I, I just don't know what their, their end game is. That's what I'm wondering at this point. What's your end game right now? Because it looks like you're trying to go all in for maybe a three-year or four-year contract to a soup for a, an all-star player. But you guys don't have what it takes to keep that player in a championship situation if one of these superstars go down. So you plan on retrading that player? Does that player know that? Like these are things. I don't know, man. I don't know. A guy like Zach Levine trying to force his way to the Lakers. He probably think he's going to be here for a while. But I would tell young Zach, like, look, man, they don't really look like they have a plan. So don't think for one second that their plan isn't to just trade you come the summertime just the same as they would trade anybody else. And no telling where you end up once that happens. I just don't know what this regime is thinking. I don't know if this regime will even be here next summer. And that's that's why I'm, I'm like, Jeannie, I don't know if you should do anything at all. I don't think the fans should really be excited about any trades coming up at all. Or look to want to make any moves because I don't think this this regime really has a plan for what it is they're about to bring in. So we could have an even worse situation for what it is they're about to do because of it. And, and I don't think people really care enough because they, they're just assuming for LeBron's situation it matters the most. LeBron can go off into the sunset and you're going to be left with a bad team and no one's going to care about them but your fan base. Like myself, people like me are going to be the only teams, player, people that care about the Lakers. Once Braun skips off to Denver or wherever he's going to be next. So I just I just encourage Jeannie to make sure she has a foundation with a bunch of picks and a lot of cap space when that happens. You know what I mean? So she can get whatever the web Banyama player Scoot Henderson would be of that year. You know, that's what I... Because you don't want to be left with nothing, I'm telling you. Or, or mortgaging everything for lesser LeBrons that can't get you even half the value, you know, half the revenue. Because I can see her doing something like that, too. Braun skips out, and then she gives, you know, $190 million to somebody that ain't really there, not not quite there. And then, then we're stuck for a long time. Then we start having the reputation of becoming like a, a different type of team. Where the Lakers used to be really good, but they've had a long run where they've been really, really bad. And so we remember them. It's, it, it can be that. Don't think it can't. Do not think it can't. So that's where I'm at with, with this. I just, I understand, you know, everybody's in a space where they're waiting for the Lakers to either do something or not do something. I hear a lot of people have, are all over the place in regards to that. I've, I've heard the consensus be up in the air. I think the Lakers are going to move. I don't think nothing's going to happen and, it's, and everything in between. But, you know, as, as for myself, looking at this, I'm just saying, looking at Rob Palenka and Rich Paul, they want to do something. That part is clear and they want us to know they want to do something but that body language says something else is in the way the question is is it for the betterment of the lakers or is it for the detriment to the detriment that's the question you know is, is holding these picks ultimately going to be the best thing for us or are we going to hold these picks to a point and end up trading it away for something much lesser than what's on the table right now and that is the biggest fear i have Talking about holding the picks, holding the picks, holding the picks, holding the picks. And then when the fire gets hotter, they end up giving the picks away for something that they could have gotten so much more for right now. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing I'm looking at. Because people be married to stuff and then they become finicky around here for some reason. That's very, very common in Lakey Land. They're all in until they're not anymore. And then what? Last minute moves that don't make sense. You know, so when you see people have a pattern, you got to call it out. And that's what I don't want Jeannie to do. If you're going to hold on to these picks, make damn sure that you do all the way through the deadline because you don't want to get to a situation where you could have had something really good right now for them picks. And then you get to the deadline and you're just like, all right, let's throw them away for something all right. No, no, we need to see that move ahead of time and make sure we don't have that happen at all. So that's what I'm looking at, man. I, I, I don't. 
I don't think the Lakers should rule out anything at all as it pertains to some of these guys who are going to be on expiring contracts. Um, they, they just, at the end of the day, their teams are rolling a serious dice, including ourselves, everybody who who has expiring contracts is rolling the dice by letting those players stay on their books through this through this um this trade deadline, especially in this this climate. We might be able to get something for some of these dudes. So I don't know. I'm just saying. So that's pretty much all of my thoughts there, man. That is that is what I have for the situation. I just want to throw that out there. Hopefully the Los Angeles Lakers are following everybody that's talking. I know I am. I'm listening to the chatter. Um, and people are just poised to see what the Lakers are going to do, you know. And, 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 and to just learn from some of our mistakes, man. Can we do some better things with our roster for the time being? I think that's what I want to say to Rob. You know, there are other things to, that can be done while we're waiting for the big thing. Do you need an assistant to help you with some of those things? Because if we're following the fullness of what it is that has to be done, this is probably not a one-man job when you're considering how many different moving pieces there are and, and, and how much there is to keep up with while you're focused on the trade market. While you're focused on the trade market, we're running into different teams with different matchups, and we need players who can help us in these matchups, and those players are not on the floor. You know, and we're, we're, we're really running into some serious schematic issues. And that's the GM's job to make sure some of them dudes are in, in lineup. So while he's trying to get Zach Levine and Bradley Beal and, and Cam Reddish and all that, can we call up Jay Huff so we can have some interior defense in the meantime? That's all I'm asking, bro. Can we, can we do some small moves that make our team complete so that we can just get some decent basketball being played out here while we're waiting for the big move? BDL44, thank you all for watching. I'm out.